Hello, everybody. Uh, hi, Nick. Good morning to you. I know it's Good six morning. in the morning uh, in California. Hope you're fine. Well, uh, we started this morning the sessions, and now in the afternoon sessions, it's four o'clock in Turkey now. Uh, we're going to listen to Professor uh, Nick Kahl uh, from the University of Southern California. Uh, he, actually, last year we were together with him. Uh, at the Communication and Millennium Symposium. It has been almost one year, I guess. It was uh, last year nowadays. So this year, he accepted again uh, talking in our symposium. So we are very thankful to you uh, because of this. Uh, today, he's going to talk about uh, public diplomacy lessons of the war in Ukraine. This is very timely, uh, actually, uh, topic. Uh, it's sometimes the number one agenda in Turkey, also in all around the world as well. Uh, right now, if you talk about foreign policy issues in Turkey, you always talk about Ukraine or Turkish Greek relations or Syria. So this, these are the main issues now. So it's very timely. That, that's why we were very happy that you were going to talk about this. Uh, we have 30 minutes. Uh, and uh, if you can start now, uh, we are looking forward to listen to you, Nick. The stage is yours. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Aladdin. I think now you have the uh, yep. option to show Yes, your you should mind. be able to see my... Uh, can you see my screen? You can share it. You have the right now. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me just, just go a second. Uh, that should have worked. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, have, you prepared okay. the have you prepared the children? For the school, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you were talking about this. In not the, quite yet. <laughs> I, um, that has to happen later. They're not Agreed. awake yet, thankfully. <laughs> Animations uh, and yeah, I can see it now. If you make it full screen, okay. you got it. Screen. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. So, well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be uh, to be back. So. Uh, public diplomacy lessons of the Ukraine war so far. Uh, I want to frame my remarks by talking about the key features in the world leading up to the crisis and war in Ukraine, because I, I think it's very much growing out of those, uh, the, those, those features. Uh, I think that there were already lessons from the first phase of the war, the crisis that began in 2014, uh, and from the immediate uh, response of Ukraine to that situation. And then I'll talk about the lessons that came this year uh, from the way in which the war has unfolded. But I want to look at it from, I guess, three points of view. First of all, the lessons that relate to the experience of the country of Ukraine itself, then the lessons as they apply to Russia, and uh, finally, a set of lessons for NATO and the European Union. And um, I'll finish up with a conclusion. And my overall conclusion is going to be that I, I see a, a world in which issues of international image and of reputation are very central now and deeply connected to the well-being of a nation state. So I speak about the world of uh, a world of reputational security, and maybe I'll say more about that uh, during questions. So first of all, the the world we're in, our, our world of me of uh, of crisis. I, I think that the second decade of the 21st century saw a number of overlapping and intersecting crises and Ukraine war reflects these crises. The first is that uh, politics in general is in crisis. Simply the problems in the world today are too big for any single actor and being faced with problems that were too large to resolve unilaterally, uh, a lot of countries uh, looked for a different kind of politics, the politics of strong men, people who uh, would um, trade on uh, nostalgia for a, uh, a, a better time and, and promise restoration of reputation uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in countries. 
the process of diplomacy, of negotiation between countries was in crisis, uh, in part uh, because uh, of a loss of credibility and authority of diplomatic actors on the world stage. I think people can um, get their information from uh, people through social networks where they're connected to people exactly like themselves. And that made it harder for diplomats to uh, engage foreign publics, even if uh, through new media it was possible to do so. Why would you want to take anything from a foreigner? Uh, is a widespread attitude around the world. Media has been weaponized. Uh, and I, I think this is both uh, domestically and internationally. You see messaging being used to polarize uh, countries. And this has been made more difficult by the technological transition to social media, uh, which has happened on a, on, a, on a mass scale. And as a historian, I'm, I'm very aware that every time a new mass medium is introduced, people seem to lack the ability to uh, judge and discern messaging, and it has a much more uh, disruptive impact on international relations than same medium does when people are, are, are used to it further down the road. So there's a lack of media specific skepticism. People haven't, you haven't learned how to evaluate messaging coming to them through social media. Uh, I think that in any case, we've seen a long-term trend since the end of the Cold War of publics becoming even more uh, significant uh, as a factor in international relations. And more attention to media, more attention to soft power in international relations in any case. This is why uh, I was already feeling uh, in the, uh, you know, five six years ago that reputation had become part of security, that we moved beyond the world of soft power to a, a much more uh, critical um, uh, stage in um, the, the uh, presence of reputation as an, as an issue. It wasn't just a little extra for the, for the most successful states. It was something that if you lacked reputation, uh, your um, your your state could your very existence could be threatened. Reputation could be a part of an existential crisis, and um, this was made worse by the particular foreign policies associated with Russia, where it made choices to disrupt. And this is part of the media weaponization uh, that I um, uh, already mentioned. And I think we underestimated the extent to which Russia was capable of uh, disrupting um, uh, media ar ar around, the, ar around the world. So now to turn to the Ukraine crisis as it began in 2014. Uh, Ukraine to me is the, was the perfect country to uh, demonstrate, unfortunately for them, it really demonstrated the damage that could happen to a place if it didn't have uh, an established reputation. The narrative that the world used to look at Ukraine in 2014 was still the post-Soviet narrative. Ukrainians themselves had an idea about their independence, their distinctiveness, uh, a long uh, history and many ways in which they were their own place, but the rest of the world still saw Ukraine for the most part through the eyes of the Soviet Union. They saw it as a, uh, a, a post-Soviet uh, entity um, that wasn't truly distinct. And uh, the things that Putin said in 2014 about Ukraine uh, being a kind of a gray area were, were um, not widely disputed or were, were taken very seriously uh, and, and um, were in step with the thinking of many other people around the world, really the majority view of, of people around the world. And as an example of this, certainly in the English language, uh, the way in which the country was spoken about, Ukraine was unclear. People were still using an older Russian language way of talking about the country, referred to it as the Ukraine, rather than just Ukraine on, it, on its own. And there are 
reasons for that, but it, it reflects uh, a failure of Ukraine to have established its own way of thinking about itself. Also, uh, we didn't use uh, Ukrainian pronunciation for places. We were still using the Russian language pronunciation for key places in the country. Uh, the media environment in 2014 was successfully disrupted by Russian media uh, when uh, the in, uh, initial uh, invasion of Ukraine took place. It wasn't clear where the soldiers had come from. It wasn't, uh, the situation was, was confused. The key, um, the key events in 2014, such as the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner over Ukraine, uh, that was uh, very confused when that happened. It wasn't clear who fired the missile, uh, and um, multiple narratives were were placed in the public sphere around that. We now know what happened, uh, but it, it was an uphill struggle uh, to establish the facts. And uh, because of the confusion over the initial uh, invasion of Ukraine and um, the uh, global response was not clear cut, it was muted. Uh, we didn't see, for example, businesses being uncomfortable trading with Russia. We saw uh, sanctions, formal sanctions being enacted, but they didn't have a kind of a, a voluntary extra take up. Uh, of the kind we see now. Ukraine responded to this situation. Uh, the Ukrainian government uh, had a clear idea that part of what was missing was international understanding of their country. They set up a cultural institute and began an intense um, period of, um, uh, of uh, what would you call it, uh, capacity building in public diplomacy. Uh, working out how the country could communicate, who the country could communicate to. Now, they realized they couldn't talk to the entire world. So they decided to focus on the European Union, on the NATO countries, on uh, United States and Canada, and um, I think did a, a remarkable job in putting Ukraine onto those countries' uh, agenda. Uh, one of the tools that Ukraine really mastered was the, the idea of a fact-checking non-governmental organization. Uh, the Ukrainian website Stop Fake uh, did a terrific job of putting, um, uh, of, of exposing disinformation and uh, making that, that visible in multiple languages. Uh, I think set a standard for that kind of work. However, as I said a moment ago, they focused on the European Union and NATO region. Uh, among the, the officials who were part of this, uh, Dmitry Kuleba um, was, was, was significant, headed up Ukraine's cultural, uh, cultural agency. He is now the foreign minister. So one of the interesting things about Ukraine from my point of view is I think it's the only country in the world where the foreign minister is somebody who is a public diplomacy specialist, who has uh, ideas about the centrality of reputation to, to security and understands that in the 21st century, uh, you need to have a good reputation and to communicate to be, to be uh, truly secure. So this brings us up to 2022 and the war and, and what uh, changes I think have emerged to the world of public diplomacy through uh, the war. Well, first, let me talk about the, the immediate run up to the war. And I think that there were some tactical successes, uh, particularly um, the, um, the, 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 the tactic we see uh, in the West uh, called pre-bunking. This is when you know that a particular message is going to be used. And so you point out to an audience that uh, a hostile actor is going to say X, Y, and Z uh, at a certain point. So uh, the Russian narratives around the war 
uh, around the outbreak of war that, oh, you, the Russians are going to claim that Ukraine has invaded Russian territory. The Russians are going to claim that Ukraine is committing atrocities. When all of these were announced beforehand, um, the um, uh, Russian messaging was much less effective. In fact, when Russia used some of those narratives, uh, there was a sense of, I told you so. It was like Russia was, um, the, the uh, NATO messaging had dug a hole and Russia got into the hole and continued digging. It, it made its own position worse and undermined uh, its own uh, credibility um, uh, at, the, at the outbreak of the war. Uh, the second thing that was very clear and had, I think, been largely missing for Ukraine up to that point was the value of personification. It's very clear, uh, certainly as the West looks at the Ukraine war, that Vladimir Zelensky is uh, central to our understanding of the country and the war. And again, as a historian, uh, it really reminded me of the way in which Winston Churchill was central to the way in which British, uh, the British war effort was understood in 1940, when Britain was in the same situation of being under attack and appealing to the to, to the um, United States for, for aid. Um, Zelensky tapped into a hero narrative that uh, seems to be innate in human beings, the idea of the, the small guy going up against the, the super powerful enemy. And I, I was uh, amused to see this uh, set of uh, street paintings uh, showing uh, Zelensky as Harry Potter and uh, Putin as Harry Potter's great enemy, Voldemort. Uh, so I think that you know, we can see how uh, the Ukraine war um, reflects much older narratives of um, the small country versus the impersonal giant uh, um, from the Christian Bible, uh, 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 David fighting against uh, Goliath, uh, and uh, there seems to be a, um, uh, th this is how Ukraine has been understood, but always through the lens of Zelensky, who has been an amazing communicator. Uh, if you compare the way he speaks to different countries, he always seems to know the thing that a, a particular place will find uh, e emotive. Um, and there are, uh, this includes, uh, the, the uh, what I'm speaking about here is, uh, We've already mentioned this value of archetypes of Ukraine describing itself, presenting itself in a universally attractive way. Um, tremendous uh, emphasis on culture, uh, reminding the world uh, what Ukrainian culture is, uh, showing the distinctively Ukrainian things, and uh, especially the Ukrainian flag, which became ubiquitous online. Um, Value of mass participation. I was really struck how many places in Britain, for example, uh, I was there in April and every place I went to had a community level uh, event supporting Ukraine. It was unlike anything I knew of um, since the uh, support for Belgium at the beginning of the First World War uh, and a, a completely amazing um, display of Ukrainian flags, of Ukrainian fundraising events, uh, and these were not being orchestrated by Ukraine, rather uh, ordinary people, or each uh, grassroots community seemed to want to do something uh, to, uh, to help because they felt outraged by the uh, invasion. Uh, I think Ukraine has shown the value of connectivity, not only connecting to um, uh, social media, but also having its leaders connect to social media. So there are Ukrainian groups that are organizing and distributing social media, generating memes, um, acting as, you know, the, the usual term now is elves. So going online as the opposite of trolls and uh, pushing a good positive message from their point of view. Uh, and um, uh, Ukraine's leaders have done a good job of using social media, of messaging and getting um, important uh, and powerful memes out to the international audience. However, I, I think that whilst these all show strengths in 
uh, public diplomacy, there are also problems emerging. And one of the problems uh, that I think was, is clear is there's a danger when you oversimplify your cause. And Ukraine had um, understated, uh, for example, the uh, strength uh, and existence of its right wing. Um, the fact that there are um, extreme nationalists involved in the Ukrainian army, some of them have nostalgia for uh, the Ukrainians who worked with Hitler, used the same insignia and so forth. And um, that side of Ukraine had been uh, excluded from representation of the country. Uh, Ukraine was embarrassed about it, but that left a uh, an opportunity for the Russians to discover uh, and publicize um, the extremism in small, small portions of uh, the Ukrainian militias and turn that into a kind of a gotcha moment, uh, a revelation. Oh, you see, what we're saying is true. The Ukrainians really are all uh, fascists, uh, which was untrue. So some of the simplification in the Ukrainian narrative opened a, a, an avenue of, of attack for uh, Russian media. There are problems with uh, ultranationalists uh, in, in some quarters of, of Ukraine. Uh, also, um, some uh, of Ukraine's gambits were counterproductive. I think it was not a good idea to put prisoners of war uh, on, on, on film. Uh, or, or on, on video. Uh, and I think um, that some of the uh, demonization of Russia that went on um, uh, uh, name calling uh, was, was counterproductive. Um, but, you know, people are going to do all kinds of things when there's so much messaging going on. Uh, some regions of the world were, were neglected and continue to be neglected. And I know that the Ukrainian foreign ministry is now thinking, how do we uh, connect to uh, the global south? Uh, and uh, that's a major priority. And they feel that, or they can see that they've um, not persuaded um, many parts of the world of the um, uh, the power of their, their message and the, the, the rightness of their perspective. Uh, limits, therefore, on non-Western sympathy for Ukraine. Uh, what about the Russian perspective? Well, I mean, I think that um, public diplomacy was one of the areas in which the Russians were uh, overconfident, uh, but the military overconfidence has been more obvious. Uh, there's no way that Putin expected that uh, the invasion would be as um, complicated as it turned out to be. We know he thought that the whole war would be over in just a couple of days. I think there's danger to the credibility of the country um, coming from the use of obvious big lies and uh, Putin's claim that um, the uh, whole war could be justified by uh, the Ukrainians being Nazis uh, was really made absurd in the West, at least, by uh, news agencies, news outlets pointing out that um, that Zelensky himself was from a Jewish family, so it didn't make sense to talk about him as being a uh, as being a Nazi, as being a continuation of Hitler's collaborationist partners in in uh, Ukraine. Uh, the Russians, however, have had more success by abandoning that narrative and finding a different narrative and reframing the war. And this is where I think uh, they have shown um, uh, skill, and that is by switching from uh, campaigning, as it were, against uh, Ukrainian fascism to arguing that the problem with the war is war itself, and therefore NATO is uh, the problem because NATO is continuing the war by aiding Ukraine. And this narrative, uh, blaming the, the war on uh, for being artificially extended and saying this war is so cruel 
uh, but it's NATO's fault for aiding Ukraine. Um, this is gaining traction, and it's an argument that is now very common in left-wing circles in the US, UK, and other European countries. Um, I think uh, there are still strengths for Russia. So whilst I would see Ukraine as showing the value of an attempt to establish reputational security, Russia is still enjoying the advantages of a longer term um, building of reputational security. Uh, we can see the value of a long term Russian narrative of Russia talking about itself in the world for a very long time and explaining what it is and what it does and what it cares about. Um, and uh, when you, we speak to people from uh, the global south, especially from Africa and India, uh, it's possible to see a valuation, sorry, a continuation of historical admiration for the Soviet Union and a feeling that, that um, uh, Russia still has a special uh, place uh, in, in, in the world. So there's a sort of a, a benefit coming from Soviet nostalgia. From the NATO point of view, uh, one of the lessons is that there's value in collaboration, that public diplomacy doesn't have to be a solo act. It doesn't have to be one country speaking. And when there's a shared problem, there can also be a shared solution. So both NATO and the European Union have done a good job of collaborating to counter the problem of Soviet media disruption and disinformation. Also, uh, I think that uh, we're seeing the value of past communication support for Ukraine. Part of the reason that Ukraine is doing such a great job of communicating is because NATO and the European Union invested a tremendous amount of money in uh, providing skills to Ukraine. There, there's been a lot of investment also in Ukraine's domestic media system so that it was more insulated from disruptive Russian messaging. I think we're now in a world where collective security can actually be a collective uh, in, endeavor uh, and we can help each other to do a better job of pushing away hostile messaging and of being better. Part of what uh, Ukraine was able to achieve in the years between 2014 and 2022 was actually to be a better country. So there were genuinely less things for Russia to uh, accuse Ukraine of because it had uh, improved in and had gone after some things like uh, corruption of, of uh, government officials. Uh, I think uh, we also see uh, in the NATO case the, the problem of a sustained narrative, uh, the challenge of a sustained narrative. And the NATO has been unable to assure the entire world that it is a benign defensive alliance. Uh, the uh, hostile frame of NATO as being aggressive has uh, remained uh, very stubborn in the minds of observers around the world. I think that we see a need to ensure the integrity of core public diplomacy work by key actors like the US and UK. And I wish both of these countries were doing more to communicate more effectively. Specifically, I'm appalled that Britain is choosing this moment to cut back on funding to the BBC World Service, which is one of the great voices for stability uh, I, I think in global media, and it's no time to cut uh, a useful and beneficial um, uh, voice like that. Uh, Biden has failed to invest properly in uh, his country's uh, public diplomacy um, as, as well. So I find that quite fr frustrating. My conclusions, uh, well, I think that the world is understanding how to cope with media disruption, how to beat disinformation, and there are so many contrasts between the situation in 2022 and how confused and disrupted we were in 2014. So I think that's a major um, finding of this year. Uh, it's interesting to see how powerful publics are. Um, the public boycott of Russia uh, and revulsion at Russian activity in the West was so strong that 1,000 companies 
have ceased or changed the key business they do in Russia. It's been really interesting to see how publics have uh, created community level responses. And I, I, I think that's shown how central publics remain in our uh, foreign policy processes. Ukraine has demonstrated the value of preparing. The day to prepare for a crisis is not the day the crisis begins. You begin preparing for crisis communication five, 10 years before. And this is what Ukraine had to do in 2014, where they were unprepared. Uh, 2022, they were prepared, and we can see the difference that makes. We have to beware of confusion and hypocrisy. If we're going to make claims, we have to stand behind those claims. And uh, I, I think that ensuring the integrity of our own side and our own values remains super important. And it's important, as always with public diplomacy, to continue to listen to global responses, not just to listen to the people who think like us and uh, speak like us. Um, and focus on our own reputational security. Step one in all this has to be listening. And to me, this is always the case with public diplomacy. Public diplomacy, as all communication, begins with effective listening. And uh, the Ukraine war has underlined uh, the value of listening and knowing your audience. So that's what I wanted to say, but I hope there's time there for, oh my goodness, I thought <laughs> I used up all the time. I'm so sorry, Latin. Uh, yeah, the, the, the time is up right now. now. Yeah, it's 30 minutes right now, but we can still, you know, talk maybe two or three minutes because I was following you in a very interested, interested in mood. And I had, I made some notes uh, about your presentation. And I would like to ask, I have many questions, but I think I can ask only one question right now. You were talking about listening. I mean, this is also, you know, it, it was mentioned in your, publications as well in the past that listening is very important in public diplomacy but does it also include listening to russia listening to putin listening to uh, the official ideology or official approach of the russian government do you also include this when you say listening because now we know that in the western media it's not easy to see uh, I'm, i'm not supporting the russian case but i'm just uh, saying that uh, it's not possible to see the russian case in the western media So how we can listen to them without really representing their ideas in the Western uh, media coverage? Well, I think you have to deal with the situation as it is. And I would see the importance of listening as um, uh, I think it's possible to um, respond to what, what Russia is saying or what the Russian government is saying, uh, and also to uh, represent what Uh, Russian people are saying and doing. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think it is, um, uh, so I do think that that's an important, uh, an, a, 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 an important process. Um, I, and in the long term, um, I think that one of the solutions to the kind of media disruption that the Russians have been pursuing in the longer term over, over the last 10, 15 years is to negotiate with, the, with Russia about this. But personally, I don't think you should negotiate over the territorial sovereignty of Ukraine. That if, if Ukrainian sovereignty is conceded, then the next country's sovereignty will be in question. Uh, they'll say, oh, there are parts of Kazakhstan that are really part of uh, Russia and so forth, and right the way across the map. We know that's how Uh, uh, countries uh, proceed. Um, so I think not only is it important to pay attention to what Russia is saying, but also to pay attention to what Russian people are saying in the opinion polls that aren't so widely known. Uh, it's very interesting to me that whilst Russians say that they're supportive of Putin, if you look at opinion polls around the issue of term limits in Russia, Um, Russians also say that it's uh, not good for somebody to remain in office for a very <laughs> long time uh, at a local level. Uh, they will say, oh, yes, no, we think that as a principle, uh, term limits are a good idea. Um, and that, that suggests a discomfort with uh, the longevity of, um, uh, uh, of, of, of Putin coming out in attitudes that is not apparent. Um, 
uh, but I think as we as it comes to messaging to Russia, which is the the bottom line of this idea of of of, of listening, um, the problem uh, of um, uh, the West has to understand that Russian people um, have there's a reason why Russia is at war in Ukraine, and um, the uh, responses, the communication with Russia has to reflect that. And uh, I think that um, it would be a mistake to, uh, and this was one of the things that the BBC learned during the Cold War, that you don't um, try and get between a public and their leader uh, and messaging that is critical or mocking of Putin uh, would be inappropriate when communicating with Russia. The important thing is to make sure that Russian people understand what's happening in the war, understand the casualty figures uh, that are happening to Russians. And communication with Russia should put front and center the extent to which what's happening is bad for Russia. Uh, because, uh, and rather than um, a uh, messaging that is based on um, uh, the kind of hostility that is part of uh, now how Americans talk and speak and demonization and mocking uh, of, of the Russian position. And to be honest, the kind of position that was reflected in those cartoons that I was showing you, you wouldn't show those uh, in, in media to Russia and say, look how we're mocking you. Uh, you you'd say, uh, look, the, your, your government is not being honest with you. It is not telling you how many people are, 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 are dying, uh, how many of your own people are dying, how bad this is for you in terms of your standing in the, in, in, in the world, how counterproductive and unnecessary this, uh, this is, and how resolute the West is in its support. Uh, that was clearly not understood. If, if Putin had understood that clearly, uh, then I don't think he would have been in, invaded in the first place. Um, but, you know, this is now, um, as we say, water under the bridge. Yeah. Actually, Does I was that make sense, Aladdin? Do you, do you want to come back now, on that? It's, it's yep. much clearer now. I was going to ask questions related to your last point, but, you know, the time is up now. I think I will, I will email you about my other okay. questions. And when you have time, you can answer it. Uh, thank you so much, Nick. It was very uh, interesting and also very useful presentation for us. It was very well, I'm timely. so sorry it went, Aladdin, I, when I practiced it, it only lasted 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm so sorry that it was extended. Because last year it was for one hour, but this year <laughs> our you know traffic is very you know uh, stuck now. So we, we had to make it for 30 minutes. But thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, it was very useful. You're very welcome. And uh, enjoy Hope. the rest of the conference. Thank you so thank, much. Thank you very much. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, now the next speaker is going to be uh, Professor Don Stax, and my colleague, Uyghur Tosuna, is going to uh, be the administrator uh, of the next uh, session. Am I just to begin? Well, first of all, let me uh, say thank you for inviting me to this conference. Uh, sorry, sorry, Professor, Professor Stax. Duygu uh, Tosunay is going to welcome you first. Okay. And then we will start, thanks a lot. Okay. Hello, sorry, my uh, computer uh, just experienced a little bit of frozing. <laughs> um, so we can start our next session. Uh, we're welcoming Mr. Don Stax uh, to make his pre uh, presentation right now. So I don't want to make it any longer to uh, not uh, cut out from your time of the presentation. So please, you can start and have a go. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I have never been to Turkey. Uh, I've been invited, but could not. Uh, could not make it due to some problems at the airport a few years ago. Uh, thank me, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, good afternoon, I believe, to most of you. And it is morning here. As you can see, it is a nice day at the beach. Uh, 
for those of you who don't know, I recently retired and have basically just finished my last manuscript review for uh, in terms of journal publications. I'm still editing the Business Expert Press series on public relations and, and practice. Uh, so when I was asked to make this presentation, I was trying to think, well, what could I talk about that would help others, help them in terms of their academic career? Uh, and I thought, I've been, in, I've been in education now, academia for over 20 years, over 50 years. Uh, I am an eclectic researcher. What I mean by that is, you know, most academics find a hole and dig it as deep as they can to become the penultimate uh, expert in that area. I get bored real easy and I start looking for other sort of things. So I, I don't want to start that as a preface to, to simply say that when I look at communication, I look at communication across all our silos. Now, how you define those silos, as I'll talk about in, in a minute, will impact what, what you've done, what you think now, and, and where you're going to go. A little bit about me, uh, I got an undergraduate degree like many people did in, in my age, in, in my country in English, and communication seemed like a wonderful second major. It was called speech back then. And I was extremely lucky to have a course in propaganda and a course in interpersonal communication. Now this is back in, in the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, it sort of set me on a line. I graduated from college and the United States Army said, hmm, I don't think you need to do anything for a couple of years. So looking at the Army and saying, yeah, there's no way I can get out of it. I'll, I'll beat them. So I enlisted. Uh, it was a mess. Uh, as an undergraduate English major, I had had linguistics class. I aced the linguistic test. Uh, they didn't know what to do with me. I ended up in a military intelligence, counterintelligence unit in Washington, D.C., or actually in the suburbs for a while. Uh, where I was assigned to be a production specialist in terms of putting out top level uh, military intelligence uh, documents. Uh, they trained me to be a, an illustrator. They trained me to be a, a typist, much better typist than I was. And now the reason I bring this up is because I met my future brother-in-law in that same unit. Matter of fact, he edited and I produced. That individual, his name was Mark Hickson, who has had and will continue to have an emphasis on my life as we go through. And as you'll find, as you listen to older speakers, that they go back and identify those folks. Mark was one of the first PhDs out of Southern Illinois University in organizational communication. I believe his degree was 72. As such, and in, in the army, uh, as an editor, he had a, a way to establish the time in which we worked. And being an organizational communication specialist, he knew how to play the system, shall we put it that way. Long story short, he couldn't get published because the journals back in that time were not dealing with applied communication. So he got upset and he came to me and says, why can't we do something to rectify this? And I said, we can. So we created the Journal of Applied Communications with an S at the end, because he looked at how communications across the various applied areas were applied, interpreted, and evaluated. That journal, and we were told that we would never make it. By the way, the Army published that they didn't know it uh, at the time, but uh, it was published on eight by 10 inch paper, which is what the Army uses. Uh, that journal is now one of the top four journals in the National Communication Association. Uh, but that's where I began. And as I worked with Mark, I learned that I really like this stuff. I like this organizational communication. I like the way in which we look at internal communication. And what happened was I started to do some graduate work at American University and had to take a methods class with a journalism professor. Now, Math to me 
is apples to oranges. I don't like math. I don't like doing it. Uh, I'm a statistician to a large degree who doesn't like math. I don't like proofs. I like the theory behind it and what you do with it, what the steps are. And that's how I've taught my students over the years. Most PR students, most communication students avoid every math class they can because uh, they're interpersonally oriented. So I did that. And I also took a class in small group communication and a class in political communication from a young man by the name of Jerry Hendricks, who is just new out of Louisiana State University. If you've ever looked at one of the top first case books in public relations, Jerry wrote it. Uh, from there, I got out of the army, went to Auburn University, which is where my wife at the time had just, my future wife had just graduated. And that's where Mark went to get his master's to work with his mentor. He took the semester off or took the year off on a sabbatical. And I ended up with a degree basically in in communication education and intra-personal communication, which had just become big. I went from there to the University of Florida where I worked with Mike and Judy Bergoon, extreme behavioralist to a large degree and focused on persuasion, nonverbal communication. We were not allowed to take an organizational class. So I had to catch up on that. But what I've done is in doing so, I have been influenced by an awful lot of different people with strangely divergent thoughts. I am a trained rhetorician. I am a trained intrapersonal communication uh, uh, researcher. Uh, we published the first paper on, on neurocommunication in terms of how the brain receives messages when hemispheres are divided. And it was interesting because the results did not meet or did not match the expectations that we would have had from classical communication theory. In other words, based on the assumptions of communication, we would have expected something else to come out. So one of my first points that, that I like to make to students is always go back and test those assumptions. If you're a social scientist, you build your research on other research. It's imperative that you go back and read that initial research. And even if you have to actually go to the library. Uh, second aspect is that because I'm interested in the psychological elements that deal with communication, what I'm interested in is behavior outcome. In the organizational setting, the behavior outcome is employees doing what management wants what, and management perceiving what employees want and then acting on it. Uh, how to create a, a climate of trust, a, a climate of, of uh, other areas. Listening, which I'm also a trained listener, uh, listening uh, uh, person. Uh, is extremely important. And I have been working in that for years and years. And it's, it's interesting that in, in the area I'm now working in, corporate communication, listening has become big again. As a matter of fact, Arthur W. Page, the first CCO, uh, modern CCO, in his, ten, in, his, in his page principles, talks about the notion of listen to the customer. Well, that's been changed to listen to a wider variety of aspects, but it's extremely important. So as you might guess, I've dumb, dug a number of deep holes. I published in each of those holes. And uh, what I've been concerned with as I have advanced through being journal editor, book publisher, uh, respondent. Uh, I think I've been on just about every editorial board you can think of uh, across communication. Uh, believe it or not, I've reviewed for qualitative. I'm a quantitative researcher, but I truly believe in triangulation. But I was driven by something I found in my doctoral studies in a philosophy of science class. And that's a theorem by, the, by a philosopher by the name of Arrow. And what Arrow argues is your research question drives your methodology. Your methodology drives your tests, which would be logical, statistical, however you want to do that. Test drive interpretation and interpretation drives evaluation. 
kind of a linear perspective. It, it's almost hypothetical deductive to a certain degree, uh, but we're short of that in the real world. I've spent the last 20 years dealing with real world communication problems uh, with corporations, with advertising agencies, with, with firms, and trying to help them assess and evaluate their different campaigns. And what I found is they have a lack of theory, a lack of communication theory, and they have a definite lack of understanding of research and measurement. So when we look at this sort of approach, the idea is to approach it from the area that you are best well-grounded in, and it may be qualitative. You can't ignore the numbers. On the other hand, if you're quantitative, you can't ignore the qualitative aspects, the in-depth material that we get. So when I approach a research question, typically from the quantitative side, first thing I do is try to define the concept I'm working with. If I can define it, I can measure it. Now, this is where I'm finding problems with some of the younger people in that they come up with a measure and they don't test it. Or the testing is done post hoc rather than a priori. In other words, we're not seeing the pilot tests that we used to see and could publish in, in some journals. So if you look at it from that perspective, that is, if you can define it, you can measure it. And if you measure it, what are you measuring for? The reliability of the test, because without reliability, validity cannot be possible. And then the validity of the test. So the first test says, are you measuring the same thing the same way over and over and over? Much like a scale, you step on the scale and the, the weight is approximately the same each time. Uh, but in validity, the question of validity, are you measuring what you think you're measuring? Because you can be reliable, but not valid. And this is a, a truism that I have, I drive home to my doctoral students or drove home since I'm no longer teaching, drove home to my doctoral students. It's the question of reliability and validity. And how do you get that? Well, you get that by going into the real world and asking people to respond qualitatively to what you're looking at, and then you can go back and, and verify it. So what you have to do is you have to define. Once you define, then you have to see are other people looking at it the same way you are, which is a validity aspect. And then what you try to do is you try to establish a value for your research. And this is extremely important in the professional world. What's the value of the research? And what that value will do is drive policy. I listened at the end of Professor Cull's uh, presentation, and he was really talking about a policy orientation based upon his perception of the value of what he has seen going on in his own research. So he very carefully established a way to set up policy statements. In other words, this is what we should do. This is what we should do. As a quantitative empiricist, I was always trained to avoid that. I was trained to avoid value at the same time. So what we're looking at is the notion that you have to marry multiple methodologies together to get to an outcome. And then you've got to be able to report it. If you have read an academic journal and you try to interpret that to a non-academic, what you typically end up doing is spending a lot of time on the methodology, the statistics, and then you interpret. And what they're looking for is your evaluation. They want to know is, will it work? What is the behavior change going to be? If you're focusing on public relations, a corporate reputation, uh, return on investment, what you're looking for there are predictors of those sort of things. So for example, you go in as a consultant to a company that's having trouble putting a widget out. Okay, the widgets just aren't any good. If the widget isn't any good, what happens to sales? They go down. So you create a campaign to increase the quality of the widgets by perhaps a, a campaign that deals with teammanship, deals with uh, elements of esteem in terms of the product. And then you, as you measure it, 
the campaign as you go through and you find how the attitudes are changing. And then you look at it and you correlate that to the number of widgets coming out that are high quality compared to low quality. And you have a return on investment. Now, it took me 25 years to realize that. And in order to do so, you've got to do other sort of things such as uh, focus groups, which are qualitative in nature, and, and work through it that way. About 15 years ago, David Michelson and I, David is one of the most brilliant professional methodologists in, in the area of public relations that I've ever met. Uh, we met at the, uh, measurement, the, the measurement commission and we kind of hit it off. Uh, he's kind of sarcastic and, and I can be at times also. And we just kind of tagged off each other on some things and say, hey, he's, he's not a bad guy. Maybe we could do some work together. Well, we did, but David comes out of a market-driven economy. I come out of an intellectually-driven economy. The two are not the same. We did a survey of a product together, and he wanted to use four-point measures. Strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. Okay, And I said, David, we don't want to do that. We, we're losing 66% of our uh, data. Well, what do you mean? Well, all we really care about is those that agree or disagree. I said, well, you know, Mr. Marketer, yeah, you're probably right. Well, what about those customers who have no idea? That is, they're undecided. They're your future customers. He sputtered and, and, and said, let's do this. Let's divide our sample in half. But half of them will use the ordinal measure and the other half will use the interval measure. And I had to sit down and talk to him about what uh, an interval measure was compared to an ordinal and then, you know, teach him the different aspects that were going on. We did the study and we got two different interpretations coming out. What he found was on this particular brand that people liked it. Okay. But if you added the undecided, okay, vastly more undecided people were there than people that liked it. Now it wasn't the normal curve. It was skewed, it was skewed toward the positive side. So, but anyway, he started to understand that. So we started questioning some of the assumptions that are basic research. That's what the measurement commission was supposed to do to begin with. And at the time they were talking about public relations being six times more effective than advertising. Okay, six to 11, Edelman said 11, uh, Ketchum had six. So we moved out to test that. And we did an experiment in the field with both qualitative and quantitative measures. We actually created a, a New York Times food section uh, with, with a bunch of stories around. And then we had an advertorial and we had an ad. And then we asked questions about it afterwards. And what we, what we looked at was how much more effective was the ad than the PR piece? And guess what we find out? They were equally effective. Now it's a test of assumption. It is assumed within the industry that, that advertising will sell more than public relations. Now we maximized the, uh, the, the story that we used and we had something you probably wouldn't do normally. Okay, but we got an, another major corporation interested and, and they said, well, what happens if you put both on the same spread? It's both on the same page of a newspaper, maybe on a screen nowadays. Oh, that, that's interesting. Practice says you can't do it. Okay, this company put $180,000 into it. We redid the study having ad only, PR, advertorial PR only. Uh, then we had them both, and then we had one that had nothing in there as a true control group. It was almost a Solomon Ford design we set up. We did it across the United States in 10 different malls. We had over 600 respondents. And guess what we found out? Advertorial was, was, was number one, okay? Advertorial plus ad was number two, and number three was the ad by itself. So we tested that assumption and we told people you should do this. And now you start to see it. Uh, I think we've come a long way and I'm trying to stay within the time, time measurements as much as possible. And I wanna give you guys some time to, to ask questions if you have them. Uh, we've come a long way. 
have more silos out there now than we've ever had before in our life. And we have silos within silos. I'm doing organizational communication, but only in uh, pharmacy related public relations. Okay. And in 50 years ago, you had rhetoric with two different levels. You had interpersonal, small group, and organizational communication. Intrapersonal wasn't, wasn't known or understood. Uh, I was on the first board of the NCAA Intrapersonal uh, Commission, and which is now a, a, a large division in terms of itself. But I think what you have to do is you have to go back and test those assumptions. You have to test the assumptions that people haven't changed since the 1950s, 60s, or 70s. And I think you have to live through that to see that. But you need to go back and look at the original work. And in some cases, that's not possible to do because it's been torn out of the library, so they couldn't go ahead and scan it. Uh, but you need to go back and look at the original work, understand how it was put together, and then take what you are good at, put that into your research, and find somebody, team up with somebody who's good at the qualitative or the quantitative or the interpretive, whatever you want to do, and come up with a research project that in the end not only defines, not only demonstrates that the concepts are there and are working, okay, but they have value for the target audience and they work. Now, what do I mean by they work? Quite simply, people do what we ask them to do. Typical attitude change type thing. And you can go all the way back to the ancient Greeks on that. Uh, Wayne Thompson, who I had for rhetoric at, the, at Auburn University, uh, who, by the way, was the first quantitative researcher to publish a book in the communication field. Uh, I read his book that he was, he was writing on the enthymeme. I learned more about enthymemes than I ever wanted to know. Okay? And enthymeme is a, is a matter of speech that comes out of the rhetorical practice of Aristotle. Uh, so it all comes back together. So if I were to summarize 50 years of research, I would say, you start off small, you dig that hole because you have to get tenure or you got to be promoted or whatever. And then sometimes it helps to find another hole that's related or can be related because down the road, they're gonna come together. I said before, I'm a listening trainer, I'm certified. Uh, I've done research in listening. I've presented to the corporate world on listening before it was big. Now the big agencies are in there doing it. I made $50, they're making $5 million. Uh, typical for an academic. But anyway, my suggestion is that always look back to what's been done before. Question what's been done before. Marvin Shaw, who taught me measurement at the University of Florida, who wrote the first book on measurement coming out of World War II, he and I decided we'd want to try to start our own journal because I've been lucky enough to do one with the Journal of Applied Communication Research. We wanted to call it the Journal of Irrepro Irreproducible Results. You had to find what you couldn't, you had to find what wasn't found. Because once something gets into our system, and especially today with computer searches where you don't actually read everything as you're going through or you skip things, okay? Certain facts take on the notion that they're a fact for life. And we know that there's no such thing as a lifetime fact. The fact today may be different tomorrow, and we may perceive it today as different than what it was back then. So that's 50 years in 20 minutes. Uh, hopefully, there's, I've, hopefully there's something there you can come away with. Uh, I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Uh, but I also want you to be able to have the time with, with the next speakers. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, cooperation. Uh, it was a very nice topic to listen on my behalf. So thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Yeah, I did my job. You, you, you know it so <laughs> well that actually it's, if you think about it, it's, it's how we try to work as we work without the pressures that are thrown in otherwise. And, uh, oh, there's David Weaver. We haven't been on a panel in years, David. 
anyway, uh, I appreciate your attention and I hope you have a great afternoon and I wish the conference uh, best uh, proceedings as they go along. So thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a nice day. No, you too. Okay, Dugo, uh, thank you very much. And also the Professor Stack. Um, Professor Weaver is also here, but before him, we have uh, Tassos Teofilou from University of Bournemouth from the UK. Uh, hi, Tassos. Hi, Alan. How are you? How are you doing? Thanks okay, for having thank me. Much. Uh, I think we are hosting your first time in Communication in the Millennium, right? Have you ever participated in? I don't think so. Uh, uh, at, your, at your symposium? No, no, no. Actually, this is the first time. So, okay. um, a special thanks to, to you guys for inviting me here to be the keynote. And of course, Dr. Yuxel and Dr. Gurpe uh, for you know giving me the opportunity and privilege to, to listen to you guys. I mean, I go after Don Stacks, so you're really setting me up to fail here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's like it's champ Champions League right now. It's, it looks like Champions League, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it does look. It does look like that. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a top he's a top guy in in public yeah. relations. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, the, the title of your work today is "Challenges of PR: Education versus Education and versus Practice." Uh -huh. um, in the program, uh, I'm going to check it now again. Uh, you have 15 minutes, not 30 minutes, so. Uh, if we can finish in 15 minutes, we will be very happy. I want to make you happy then. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so again, uh, special thanks for, for you guys for having me over. Um, it's, uh, it's a topic I chose to talk about, uh, which is, um, um, I don't know, it's a... Uh, I find it I, I find it quite challenging and interesting. I mean, I have the privilege to work in the United Kingdom, which means that that gives me the opportunity to put my paws in many different jars, uh, which means that um, following some discussions with uh, uh, great colleagues and Ben Smith, who is in charge of PR moments, uh, discussions with a Chartered Institute of Public Relations, um, where I serve as an external, and uh, having the pleasure to work with this fantastic team of people uh, under the umbrella on a project under the umbrella of the PRCA, it seems that there is this one philosophical question issue which is still around, uh, and it, it ties quite nicely with what uh, probably Don uh, was was talking about in a sense of whatever you find, question it. Uh, the, the whole thing is, uh, is a philosophical discussion and a practical conversation really uh, around the area of, um, of education. So it's interesting times for PR education. And uh, you know what, it, it's quite funny how um, what British mean when they say interesting, uh, they don't really mean interesting. They, they mean usually something which is challenging, something which needs to be explored, something that you need to, be recon to, to reconsider. You can imagine my, my surprise when I had to learn this the hard way 15 years when I moved to the UK. Uh, you know, we were bouncing ideas and, you know, someone, when I said something, uh, said interesting. You know, I was so naive that I actually thought he found that interesting. Uh, I think that the loose interpretation was, are you nuts? You need to rethink about that. So in a sense, it is interesting times for PR education. Um, the two main questions uh, that, uh, that seem to lead the discussions in the UK uh, are about, uh, in a nutshell, the decreasing numbers of PR degrees. And I have a question mark there. There is this kind of general feeling that the number uh, of communication slash PR degrees is coming down. And uh, to be more precise, there are much less PR, purely PR oriented degrees like bachelor in public relations as we had a few years ago. And there is always a question, which is, um, again, um, one that pops a lot, uh, is the industry of public relations uh, supporting really the PR degrees? Now, in order for me to elaborate uh, and carry on investing this case, if, if I start with, with uh, the first thing I just said, taking the pass from the industry, uh, the public relations industry uh, seems to be the only industry which is so skeptical and critical perhaps around its education. I'm not sure if you find that in, in Turkey as well. I'd love to hear your views after that. Uh, it feels sometimes, you know, if we take this um, analogy and we, we think perhaps about a doctor, imagine if a doctor actually said to someone graduating from a university studying medicine, yeah, I'm not sure you really needed a university degree. 
uh, or you know, a lawyer suggesting to um, to someone that you don't really need a degree. Uh, you can be self-taught. You know, why spend money uh, and time doing this this degree? Uh, it, it it almost seems when you read some sort of professional sources around public relations that. Um, we could have used in PR education a bit more support from the industry of PR, but you know um, there might be multiple explanations around that. For example, a uh, public relations degree in the UK uh, started in 1989. Uh, Bournemouth University was, uh, I think, the first uh, PR degree ever, which means that the first graduates were around 1992, so in their 50s right now or something like that. So the majority of graduates which are working in the industry of PR uh, by default fault and only by doing that kind of math uh, you can we can understand that you know they're graduates of different kind of degrees rather than PR degrees another point to consider uh, in order to explain this kind of I'll dare say industry versus education competition uh, is the fact that uh, some professional bodies and you know I'm, I'm saying this without any sort of accusation I'm saying as an observation uh, push towards their own agenda uh, the uh, professional bodies uh, have their own training, apprenticeships, and, and qualifications. So, you know, one, one could, could argue in a sense that is that something that perhaps one could suggest to uh, a young practitioner to do rather than study public relations? Um, my third point of explanation is that the universities have made it very, very difficult for us to collaborate with practitioners. Uh, 15 years ago, we had people which uh, had this kind of industry experience. They were fantastic. Uh, we could employ someone who, who was called really, um, what was the name of it? Uh, practitioner in practice. So that was quite cool. You know, we had that person uh, joining us for our teaching and sharing this kind of experience. Now the university making it so difficult for us to appoint someone like that and to actually appoint anyone who doesn't have a PhD uh, really created this kind of, again, of, of competition uh, between practitioners and academics. You know, you have people with 20 years of experience and, you know, they look at you in a sense of, well, isn't that worth a PhD? And, you know, you want to say that that's not what we're measuring here, right? It's we, we should be on the same side, caring about the industry, caring about producing air quotes there, uh, students who are going to be good in what they're going to be doing. And they're going to love uh, the PR as a discipline and, of course, the practice of it. Um, and finally, uh, the fourth point of explanation is that there is some sort of assumption, which uh, if you go on the, on the websites of professional bodies in the UK, or if you follow some sort of conversations or, you know, uh, sort of uh, symposiums like you guys have here, uh, there is an assumption that there is a lack of talent I don't know how to respond to that as in talent of hiring new people, uh, for, uh, companies or agencies hiring new people uh, for PR. I, I do not have an explanation for that. I'm, I'm not sure where I sit with that uh, about the whole thing with talent. Uh, I don't think there's a shortage of talent, but I'll tell you what. Uh, I do think and I do put uh, a lot of responsibility, I'll say the word clearly, blame, uh, on the fees that people have to pay in order to study in the UK. Uh, the fees have been tripled since, um, since uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I remember uh, late, late 1990 something, 1999, uh, until 2011, 12, maybe 2013. The fees to study uh, for one year uh, in a bachelor degree in the UK were approximately 3,000 pounds. In 2012, uh, the fees went up to approximately 8,000 to 9,000 pounds. Now, this has a huge consequence. I mean, when reading the data uh, of Bournemouth University, the marketing team of Bournemouth University, you know, the, the data was collected from first year students and they were asked about their degrees. What do you expect? What is it that you're, you're looking for? What, what, what? Uh, now, the, these uh, students, uh, they were the first to say uh, approximately 60 or 70% of PR, first year PR students, they didn't know what to expect. Right. So you do understand that if you pay eight thousand pounds, you don't really have the space to actually, you know, take any sort of risks with that. Um, so I do assume because, you know, I was leading the program, the PR degree back then, I did receive a number of phone calls following the year after the fees went up where we had much less students. I mean, our, we used to have 80 students before the fees went up and then we had something like 25. So that means that, you know, 
less students, I guess less talent. Or, you know, the less students means less applications for placements. So that is probably part of my explanation with that. And, and of course, you know, uh, I do put some sort of blame again on the fees uh, about the education, because then you have this kind of sense, which I call education versus education. The paying approximately £80,000 right now after Brexit for a year, so see that we started 3000 actually we started with nothing, but around 2000 we had £3,000 per year. 2012, we had something like £8,000 per year. After Brexit, we have something like £18,000 per year for an undergraduate degree. Now, you understand how much that pushed towards this kind of student slash customer orientation. The students became more demanding in a sense. I'm paying so much money. What are you doing about this? Which led to actually uh, this kind of uh, follow the UK following this kind of model of um, having pathways, majors and minors like they have in the States. So someone wouldn't pay 18,000 pounds just for PR, but they would pay 18,000 pounds apparently if they had something like marketing and PR marketing communications with PR, right? So you see how this whole competition style of pleasing the student slash customer uh, and develop all these programs hasn't really led, has led probably to having pure, those, those degrees which were purely in PR being less, like we don't have that many BA Hons public relations or BA public relations, but we have something like 232 offerings. And this is uh, UCAS data by 59 universities in the UK, which offer something which entails public relations, right? So again, it's, it's not great, but you can see how this has become a huge challenge for the education of PR, um, of what I just said. Now, the consequences of, of all this uh, is, uh, uh, are, are more than obvious. We have diversity issues in the universities, which means that, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, for graduates probably glass ceilings uh, for for women women working in PR. The majority of our students are usually females. I'm not sure there's much diversity in terms of you know people from other countries, colors, and all that. Uh, we we do have this kind of uh, our, I'll dare call it um, uh, the education offering I just said the relationship with the industry, and and of course we have sometimes. Um, uh, this kind of difficulty of having areas to focus. We can see that uh, there's a lot of Mark Holmes going on rather than uh, clearly PR. Uh, and, you know, it, it, seems, it seems that we are revisiting some thoughts uh, of critiques like my good friend Kevin Maloney, where he used to say uh, public relations is like soft propaganda. Right now, it, all, it almost feels that that Mark Holmes element uh, is is pushing us towards uh, towards that area, and we we are in a sense not seeing as clearly other elements of public relations, which were uh, more obvious in previous years, like for example uh, the involvement of public relations in in policy making. Um, is there hope? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I didn't want to put everyone down with all this. It's just you know uh, thoughts I wanted to share with everyone. Uh, no question about it. Yes, there is hope, uh, and that is in the case. How do how do I know? How can I be sure about that? Uh, well, the historical data is, is rather key with that. Um, if we go through the historical knowledge that we have gained over the years, we can see and we can learn from the past how to develop um, our future. Uh, and if I wanted to put there a spin and discuss, Aladdin, I can see you're jumping with your microphone. I have another five minutes. What's up? Uh, yes, Thassos, can we just summarize in the next uh, three, four minutes, please? <laughs> I, I, I see the time, buddy. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> okay. if, if, I, if I had to, if I had to uh, you know, give a positive spin here, I would say that historical data is key. And taking the example of Turkey, and I'm not sure how, how much you guys have been following. I'm sure you guys know the historical developments, but I'm not sure how much your industry understands and appreciates the historical developments in Turkey. I will probably say that there are a lot of research published in Turkey connecting uh, nation branding with public relations from my good friend Pinar, uh, the beauty contest, which was used to modernize, to show the modern side of, of the, um, the, the state of, of Turkey, uh, the untold story of public relations when they, they were gaining support for their independence war, uh, and 
many more examples on, on that side. We have a lot of research, historical research in Turkey on diversity uh, and you know how women were really Catholic in their influence uh, with the establishment of public relations. I was really impressed that the first president uh, of the Public Relations Association of Turkey uh, was actually a, a lady. Uh, and uh, education, we can see how, again, this is uh, research by Ebru, Pinar, Melike, and Sanem, where they were talking really about uh, how the history element perhaps needs to be amplified, or at least they were trying to observe what is happening with uh, teaching history of PR in their programs. And they saw how it really ends up being taught as introduction to PR. Uh, Dennis and Umu, uh, they talked about you know, corporate communication and how this has been a focus in the postgraduate thesis. And of course you have um, Sarah's Bursu and Gulnur research where they talked about how they were pioneers and how, as you can see quite obviously, there are many sectors that already appreciate since I don't know when public relations. So we have very, very good grounds right, to be optimist about the future, which should reflect on the education of PR, but we need really to, to in every country, to have a good collaboration with the industry. We really need to do some public relations uh, for our PR society and our uh, PR education. And only because I want to make you happy, there you go, the secular. I hope it thank means you so thank much. You. I, I hope it means thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit more than 15 minutes, but it's okay. My observation in the UK related to your presentation is uh, when I was looking for PhD programs a long time ago, a decade ago in the UK, I was checking the departments and also the, especially the media schools. And something was interesting for me uh, that the number of PR departments in the U British universities was quite limited. If you compare this with the Turkish example, for example, in Turkey, if you have media school, if you have communication faculty, for example, normally they have PR department. Would uh, they call it PR department? For BA, yeah. But, in, but yeah, it's public relations and advertising mainly. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, I think it was uh, something under marketing department or maybe a business department. So it wasn't specifically PR department, I guess. It, it is. It was as a department. As a department, we didn't have standout departments, you know, living in small silos. So mm -hmm. that was a greater idea that you had departments which were under corporate marketing communications or journalism and all that. The important thing for me was that PR, PR was placed under education under a media school in the UK, which mm -hmm. th that was something that uh, I really appreciated because coming from Greece, PR was taught as a sub, sub element of the business school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you missed a lot of things about public affairs, uh, policy, political communication. You really focus on the marketing aspects and PR being probably the fifth P <laughs> of marketing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> rather than anything else. Uh, so, yes, now, now the degrees are also quite less. So your observation for the departments now reflects on the names of the degrees as well. I have just learned that now it is 18 thousand pounds this is crazy money already for, for is, one year right it, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's per year. I, I, I had to check it because they, they, you know, I hadn't realized it because, you know, I kind of live here that yeah. now with Brexit, uh, EU uh, candidates have to pay 18,000 pounds per year. It was eight to 10,000 pounds like 10 years ago. As far you, as are, you are correct. And because, and because I'm, 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 I'll say a bit, but I think I'm significantly older than you uh, in the nineties. <laughs> <It was, laughs> in the nineties, it was completely free to oh, study okay. in the UK, an undergraduate degree. Then that the Blair government introduced the 3,000 pounds and you can't imagine what happened the year before they moved it to 9,000 pounds. As I said, when students go to study PR, they don't know what it is. So they couldn't take this kind of risk paying 9,000 pounds to learn what PR is. So we had 80 students and it dropped to approximately 30. <laughs> it was, and, and now, now if we hadn't done this kind of merge, I do fear that perhaps, you know, it was quite a strategic move to have PR and something or Marcoms with PR. All right. So when, I, when the Iron Lady was at the office, it was free, eh? That's um, uh, I'll, I'll, I, I hate to admit it, but actually during that time, uh, I've heard from other colleagues who were more senior than me that not only was it free, but uh, students also got a few, some money to study. Wow. So you were... So see the transformation there. So and 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 of course we, let's not forget the Blair government were really you know the 
Democrats. In yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Labour, exactly. The, Labour the Labour, government, yeah. I would expect it from the Tories, yeah. but not, not, not from that government. Anyway, yeah, that's a cruel okay, reality. Thank you, so thank you much. very much. Thank you for coming. You. Hope to see you next time. Absolutely, in person. Looking forward. Thanks Take care. Thanks Lovely meeting you. Okay, before we are going to listen to Professor Weaver, we have um, one more presentation, but this is uh, from a file, from a PowerPoint file. Uh, Christian Ogan, Professor Ogan, uh, she sent me her uh, PPT file, so I'm going to play this file now. I'm Christine O'Donnell, a retired professor of communications and journalism from Indiana University, where I taught for a uh, while. <laughs> retired and uh, still continue to do research. Uh, for my whole life, I have been interested in issues related to disadvantaged communities and social justice. And so the topic of violence against Turkey comes quite naturally to me, and I'm um, very concerned about the events that I've seen occur over the past several years and the rapid increase in the amount of that violence. So what I will talk to you about today are pieces from a couple of studies that I've done in conjunction with some problems. that I present today was conducted in affiliation with Professor Elsan Bash from Kazarmas University and Professor Honor Barra from The first part of the presentation will be from work that I did with Elsan Bash and the last to Professor Barra, but it does not include his a piece of that research. I am grateful for their assistance and really pleased to have had this time with all of them. As you probably know, the cases of violence against women in Turkey and the cases of femicides perpetrated on women have been increasing over the past years. 158 women from January to July in this year have been acknowledged by the Ministry of the Minister of the Interior in Turkey. But since July, that number has climbed to 303 women, according to Anand Sayaj, which keeps a tracking of all the women they know of who have been murdered and details about their deaths. Why? Uh, my colleagues just told me that uh, the sound coming from the file is not very good. So uh, I think we should present this maybe tomorrow or Friday. So maybe it's better to uh, now listen to Professor Weaver. Um, he is going to be our next presenter. Uh, and the next session is going to be uh, administrated by... Sorry. Okay, and then the next moderator is going to be Professor uh, Erkan Yüksel. Uh, Professor Yüksel, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, Professor Weaver yeah. is here. Hi, Professor Weaver. Hi. Hello, Erkan. How are you, Professor David Weaver? Hi. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, we had some problem with the previous uh, file, that's why we had to skip uh, Professor Ogan's presentation. So now I think we can listen to Professor Weaver. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I want to uh, talk today about Donald Shaw, 
who um, I think many of you know from the McCombs and Shaw research on agenda setting. And he uh, passed away uh, uh, exactly one week from today, a year ago. Uh, so um, I knew him for 50 years um, and he was my dissertation director in 1974. And he, of course, was best known among journalism and communication scholars as one of the two founders of agenda setting research with Maxwell and Holmes in their famous public opinion quarterly article in the summer of 1972. But before, uh, Donald Shaw became involved with Max McCombs in agenda setting. He was first a, a journalism historian and he did not give up historical research after that 1972 article. He produced some enduring historical research as well as his more widely known contributions to agenda setting and then later to uh, what he called agenda melding. Um, his historical research included uh, this uh, often cited study of the telegraph and news bias that was published in Journalism Quarterly in 1967, as well as studies of the nature of campaign news in the Wisconsin press from 1852 to 1916, symbols of Southern community from 1820 to 1860, and press freedom and war constraints during the Civil War period in the, in the US. Another influential strand of historical research that Donald Shaw developed on his own con concerned the rise and fall of various media and the roles of technology and leadership in these historical cycles. Uh, the most popular of all the Roy Howard lectures that I edited and published when I was on the faculty uh, of journalism at Indiana was the one by Donald in April of 1991 on the rise and fall of American mass media. Both academics and professionals were so eager to get copies of this lecture that I, we ran out of copies, which was the first time that ever happened. Um, in addition, Donald and his former student, uh, Professor Tom Terry presented numerous research papers at a symposium on the 19th century press, the Civil War and free expression. He loved this meeting more than any other, I think. And uh, he, I presented a paper with him in, in 2019 entitled US Newspaper Content from 1820 to 1860, A Mirror of the Times. And in that paper, we tried to combine historical research and agenda setting research. And, uh, and Donald wrote about this uh, in his Roy W. Howard lecture uh, saying, I'm quoting now from Donald Shaw, historians still gather, organize, assess facts, and then try to find patterns about which to write with race and clarity. The past is formless until journalists, historians, and thoughtful individuals of all kinds organize it. Then we see events. Historians are powerful agenda setters. So he made a link between historical research and agenda setting research. In spite of all his many achievements and awards, and I know he traveled to Turkey uh, several times uh, to meet with all of you. Um, and you know from meeting him that he was a humble and self-effacing person with a wonderful sense of humor. Uh, one example was his story about the time he lectured at an overseas conference and the host of the conference thanked him by saying how much they enjoyed Professor McCombs' visit. And Donald said he thanked him and said he hoped they would invite Professor Shaw in the future. Well, we were all so lucky uh, to have known and to admire Donald and to have had his support over all these years. and. Uh, even though he, he passed uh, almost exactly a year ago, I still uh, miss him greatly. Um, miss his sense of humor and his insights. Um, and I think that Professor Yuxol, uh has a uh, 
a slideshow showing uh, a number of photos of Donald and Max McCombs um, that he wanted to uh, present in this in this session. So uh, please go ahead and do that. I, I am trying to fix the uh, other computer. So I need a few minutes, please. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Um, yes. Can you see? Uh, yeah. I should say that uh, I visited uh, Max McCombs uh, a week ago, and he sends his regards to all of you as well. Yes. I had given this speech uh, last year's symposium when I was in Erzurum, if you remember, my friends. And this was a presentation for in memory of uh, Professor Shaw. And we had dedicated our symposium, last symposium, uh, for his honor. And I actually uh, want to give a short uh, summary uh, for his life. Uh, Professor Donald uh, Shaw, one of the two founding founders of empirical research on agenda setting function of the press, is a social scientist and canon professor emeritus at the University of North Car uh, Carolina at Chapel Hill. He was born on October 27th, 1936 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Shaw, a retired a uh, U.S. Army officer holds PhD in journalism from the University of Wisconsin and uh, MA and BA in journalism from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, she worked for nearly three years as daily newspaper reporter. He also has been a visiting professor at seven universities and has lectured at more than 20 universities in the United States, Europe, and uh, the Middle East and the Asia. Shove is best known for his work with uh, Maxwell McCombs of the University of Texas on agenda setting theory for his studies of 19th and 20th century American and Southern press history. During the 1968 presidential election, Shove and McCombs collected survey data from a random group of Chapel Hill residents. McCombs and Shaw's seminal article, The Function of Agenda Setting Function of Mass Media, is arguably uh, the most cited article in the field of mass communication research. In 1977, Shaw and McCombs published The Emergency of American Political Issues, which the journalism and mass communication quarterly listed as one of the top um, 35th uh, significant journalism and communication books of the century. In 1999, Sean and his colleagues published the first study of audience agenda melding, the process by which individuals mix message to create personal image of community. Since then, Sean and his colleagues have published several agenda melding articles. He is the author or co-author of uh, 18 books, as well as nearly 70 scholar articles and approximately 50 scholarly book reviews. And here are the here is the list of uh, his most uh, well known books. Uh, I call his a huge plane tree. Uh, maybe there is someone in everybody's uh, person's life, someone who reads out of him, guides him, opens doors, makes him reach from one place to another, and offers him an an expanded favor in an unexpected moment. How luckily I am, I can mention a few names in my life and as well. Donald Shaw was one of them. 
I don't know how to start. I think it will take some time to collect the memories in my mind. We met via email in uh, the early 20s, the great theorist, one of the name fathers of agenda setting theory with Professor Donald Shaw. Then together with my PhD thesis advisor, Professor Urdemray and Professor Martin Oral, we took my esteemed professor, Professor Max Feldman-Kumps and uh, Professor Donald Shaw and Professor Judith Litters from the airport. And we traveled about 20 kilometers, uh, 2000 kilometers between Istanbul, Eskişehir, Konya, Akşehir, uh, Nevşehir, Ürküp and Cappadocia. Maybe it was one of the best trips of my uh, our lives. I saw that our teacher, Professor Shaw, uh, meticulously examined historical places and artifacts. By the way, may God have mercy on my Professor Demray and my Professor Merter uh, Oral again. They also please passed away. Then I went to United States as visiting professor uh, with the invitation pro from Professor McCombs. The year was 2002. Uh, professor Donald Shaw hosted us in Chapel Hill together with my dear friend, Professor Sarah Gerpe, uh, who was a visiting scholar like uh, me with the invitation from uh, Professor Dr. McCombs. Professor Shaw got behind the wheel, drove for hours and took us to the ocean shore. We put uh, our feet in the sea. Uh, we ate fish together. Then, perhaps before one day, Professor Shaw came to the University of Texas, Austin, to visit. I told him about my study. There was also an article I wanted to finish. First, we got out, went uh, to a big hall. There was one of the biggest and longest tables I have ever seen in my life. Uh, a massive, magnificent, long historical table. And its armchairs, uh, which I think there are so historical and precious. Professor Shaw light the pace of my article uh, side by side on the table. Then he took a 50 uh, centimeter metal or plastic ruler in his hand. He started to cut paragraphs by paragraph uh, with a ruler. On one hand, on the one hand, he was asking questions, and on another hand, he was passing the paragraphs he had cut with tape uh, one after the other. It was. Uh, it was as if we were planning a puzzle. He showed practically uh, how an article should be edited. Together with Professor McCombs and Professor Gerpe, we start the International Symposium Communication in the Millennium uh, meetings. This symposium has been a great experience, a great educational platform, a great career step for hundreds of academicians uh, during the last uh, 20 years, almost, I can say. Thank you very much for listening to my presentations for uh, presentation for uh, his honor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ertan. Uh, I wonder if you can show any of the pictures of uh, Donald Shaw and, and, and Max McCombs. Yes. This presentation doesn't go. I changed the computer, so that's why I couldn't find the file I sent to you. These are some pictures from our old days. We cannot see uh, the picture. That's also also can I see, I guess. Ekranı görebiliyor musunuz? Can you see my screen? Yetkiniz var. You have the authority to to share your picture, but we can't see it. You have the option right now. Have you watched my presentations? We we we, we were just listening to you. Really? You know? Yeah. I, I was playing my presentation. Now <laughs> now it, it has started, I guess. Really? Yes. Now we can see your uh, desktop actually. <laughs> Well, we sorry, sorry. Yeah, this was my presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, is, yes. Uh, I was thinking that I, my presentation is going on. No. On your screen. 
Maybe it's you can you can now. show us the slides. Really? Yeah. Now we can see. So you can make a fast forward maybe. Yes. I had mentioned about uh, some of our memories when I was in the United States and uh, how he designed my one of my articles. And this is his book. This is a memory from uh, University of Indiana. Do you remember, Professor yeah. Weaver? Yes, I do. I'm I'm right there on, on the uh, <laughs> right. Am I look younger? I yes, and me too. <laughs> what, what year was that? I I'm trying. Two thousand seven. Seven. Wow, fifteen years already. Wow. Yes. And here is my presentation. Evet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wonderful tribute to Donald. Yes. I was wondering why this doesn't. Yes. All right. This is the video file, I guess. But yes. No, no sound. Only only the video. Yeah, there are, there was sound, a soft sound, but I couldn't play it now. Okay. Okay, it's forty-five past five. Can okay. we summarize uh, this session, Professor Yusuf? I want to thank you, uh, starting from Professor uh, Maxwell McCombs uh, for the organization of uh, this symposium. And then I need to thank to Professor uh, Donald Shaw uh, for, for all his helps uh, for the organization. And of course, I need to thank Professor David Weaver because he is one of the milestones uh, of this symposium organization. Thank you very much for participating. And uh, we want you to come to Turkey next year for the 20th symposium. Uh, I believe that it will be a big ceremony and big uh, symposium in Turkey. And it will be very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I can do that. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Professor Weaver and Professor Yüksel. Uh, now we're going to listen to uh, Sahar Kamis, and the next moderator is going to be uh, Duygu Tosunay. Thank you. Our next presentation is from uh, Professor Sahar Kami uh, from USA. Uh, University of Maryland. We're going to listen uh, her presentation titled From Technological Determinism to Digital Authoritarianism. And she sent us a video uh, presentation, so we can watch that right now. I can't hear the sound of the video. And what I will start first by giving an overview of some of the most important shifts and transformations in the Arab political media landscape. When I say political and media landscape, I always think of these two different landscapes or two different spheres as closely interconnected and interlinked and intertwined. Meaning, we cannot speak of the shifts and transitions in Arab media and what has been going on that front without putting it in the proper political context without really understanding what has been going on in the Arab political sphere, because both of them are linked to each other, and one of them certainly feeds into the other. So if we take a quick look back nine years ago, right, what happened in 2011, when the Arab uprising erupted in this region, 
can see that there was a stage of what we can describe as political euphoria. People were very excited, myself included. I am Egyptian American. And for me to see these shifts and transitions happening in my home country, Egypt, and in other parts of the Arab world was especially very exciting moment. And people had all of these high hopes and high aspirations for political and social information and for a shift to democratization and reform in the region that we were so excited and hopeful about. That was accompanied by something else, which we can also describe as techno euphoria. And by techno euphoria, I mean this whole idea of, you know, you saw the titles, right? Like, you know, all oh, the Egypt's Facebook revolution or, you know, uh, Tunisia's Twitter uprising. Uh, I, always I take these terms with a grain of salt, meaning I take them with some kind of reservation. Because at the end of the day, it is not Facebook or Twitter or blogs or YouTube, which created the Arab Spring or any other political or social movement for that matter. It is always the citizens, it's always the people on the ground who create this kind of shift whenever they decide to do so. But there was this moment of techno euphoria when people were so excited about the potential of democratization and reform, and they somehow attached many of these hopes and dreams to the power of social media. So I always say social media were supplementary factors that help to aid and to accelerate and to amplify the process of socio-political transformation in the context of the Arab Spring movements. However, they did not cause it. So they always get asked the question, there's always the question I always get asked by default, which is, do you think the Arab Spring movement would have happened had it not been for social media? And my answer is always, yes, they would have still happened, but they would have taken much longer time and much more effort because the social media acts as catalysts, so they speed up the process of socio-political change, and they also act as amplifiers. They make the voices of change and the voices of dissent louder, and they make the message much more widely received by a much greater audience, not just locally or regionally, but also globally and internationally. So there were all of these hopes and dreams, and I would say quickly that when people talk about social media, they always lump everything together in the same basket. They say social media, they always say, what type of social media are you exactly talking about? Because you know every one of them can play a different role. So Facebook, for example, can be very good for networking and for uh, you know creating some kind of snowballing momentum, right? You can create certain groups, like the group, uh, for example, that was created, the page we are all Khalid Saeed. I don't know how many of you are uh, you know familiar with it, but there was this young man who was dragged outside of the uh, internet cafe in Alexandria, Alexandria, Egypt, and was beaten to death because he dared to. A post a YouTube video which was critical of the regime and exposed some kind of police uh, corruption. He paid his life as a result of that. People created the Facebook page, we are all Khalid Saeed, in order to honor his memory and at the same time to create mobilization around this notion of fighting police brutality, right? Reminds you of the hashtag, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, for example, in the United States. And then you have YouTube which is very important for documentation, had it not been for YouTube, we would have no idea what is going on inside a country like Syria, where you have, for example, a brutal regime, you know, and really attacking its own people, and you have a horrible civil war and a horrible humanitarian crisis. Had it not been for YouTube videos, which were smuggled outside of the country and shown to the whole world, we would have no clue what is going on in a country like Syria. And then you have blogs, which open the door for a brainstorming and for conversation and for exchange of ideas and thinking about key issues. And then you have Twitter, which is excellent for minute by minute on the ground, uh, you know, co coordination and organization. There's a very interesting uh, online book I would love for you to check, which is called Tweets from Tahrir. So this particular online book is like basically minute by minute documentation. People were just, you know, tweeting to each other on the ground minute by minute as they were in Tahrir Square, it's called tweets from Tahrir, where people are saying, you know, I'm being attacked right now, please send help on the way, uh, don't use this street, go to another street, bring water with you. They were using these, you know, tweets uh, minute by minute to organize and to coordinate. So you can see here that social media can also play different roles and different functions. So that was the moment of techno euphoria that accompanied the Arab Spring uh, nine years ago. Now, fast forward, to this moment as we speak now in 2020, 
the uh, political slash media landscape in the Arab world is very different. So we saw the outcomes or the results in the so-called quote-unquote post-Arab Spring countries, and we saw that we had these unfortunate detours, right, reversals, if you will, uh, in the road to uh, democratization and uh, reform. Many of the countries that witnessed the Arab Spring uprising, unfortunately, did not have good or positive outcomes. You had Egypt, there's a return to a much more, uh, you know, brutal and much more uh, constrained uh, environment and much more, um, you know, difficult grip on power, even much worse than that which, which existed under uh, Hosni Mubarak uh, for 30 years. You have a strong military regime over there. You have Syria with the civil war that we talked about and the humanitarian crisis. You have uh, Yemen, of course, being bombed day, day in and day out. You know, you have the war there. You have sectarian strife and a stateless state in Libya. Uh, and Bahrain, I call it always the forgotten or invisible revolution because it was crushed by the regime uh, with the aid of neighboring Saudi Arabia. So the only exception really was Tunisia. It emerged as the only quote unquote winner out of, you know, from these you know, different countries. The Tunisian case was of course the only case where we can talk about some kind of success or some kind of smooth uh, transition to democratization uh, and reform, which was really uh, an example. And they, they were offered the a Nobel uh, Prize for a number of these organizations because they were able to create successful alliances and coalitions and to have, uh, you know, a very uh, bloodless and smooth and peaceful transition of power. So what does that mean in terms of the media and the media sphere and social media? How can we interpret that in light of these kinds of political outcomes? The moment of techno euphoria that we talked about before, this moment of happiness and hopefulness and dreams and ambitions was replaced, unfortunately, with what we can describe as digital authoritarianism. So that is the phenomena I'm now devoting a lot of time to studying at the moment, right? I spent a lot of time at the beginning, you know, talking very optimistically about this notion of cyber activism and the role of social media and how we can really be catalysts for change. Fast forward to the year 2020, nine years later, my research is now reflecting a lot of the realities on the ground, whether in the political sphere or the media sphere or both of them, because as we said at the beginning, they're both closely interlinked, intertwined. So a lot of my research now is talking about the phenomena of digital authoritarianism. So what does that term really mean? When the Arab Spring happened nine years ago, the activists and the protesters and the dissidents had an advantage. They were the ones who were really mastering the tools of communication and technology. They were the young, technologically savvy, clever young people who were able to master these tools in very effective ways. And the regimes were taken by surprise. They were like, oh my God, what is happening? You know, they did not anticipate this wave. They did not see this wave coming and they did not really know how to respond to it. So we saw a lot of these regimes panicking. Many of them were in a state of panic. And they did things which were very counterproductive, such as, for example, cutting the internet for a whole week. We call this pulling down the kill switch. In the case of Egypt, just closing the internet for a whole week, shutting it down, and also shutting down the cell phone service uh, also for a whole week, causing the country uh, huge economic losses and also even being counterproductive with more people flooding the streets in even bigger numbers and going out to protest even more. So other countries like the Syrian regime, for example, were watching and monitoring what was happening and they were learning they were really creating a better learning curve. So we saw the Syrian regime being more prepared than the Egyptians and the Tunisians in response to the uprising when it took place in Syria. They did not shut down the internet for a whole week like the Egyptians did. They would just shut it down, for example, on Thursday evening and Friday when people were more likely to go out and protest. And by doing so, they avoided many of the uh, you know, negative consequences of what the Egyptian regime has done. And at the same time, they created the Syrian Electronic Army, which is an army of professional hackers who would go after the dissidents or the activists online and hack and sabotage their websites and get into their own activities online. And even in some cases, severe cases, you can see some of the activists and protesters and dissidents being tracked, not just online, but also even in the real world. And as we all know, that means that the Arab region became a dangerous area for journalists and for dissidents and for protesters because 
they can get hacked online, but they can also be tracked offline. And in some cases, like we saw in the case of Jamal Khashoggi, that can have huge uh, you know, uh, outcomes, even in terms of losing their own lives. Not to mention the big number of journalists who are being behind bars, you know, they are uh, detained, arrested, and that is an ongoing phenomena, unfortunately, that is taking place day in and day out. So what does that mean? It means that we have, the regimes are now picking up, they are sharpening their own tools, they are creating new phenomena where they are matching, if not in many cases, exceeding the technological potential and savviness of the journalists and activists and dissidents and protesters who used to be at the forefront of technological savviness and advancement and uh, using cyberspace for their own purposes. So digital authoritarianism today means that many of these regimes and governments in the region are sharpening their tools and becoming more technologically savvy and therefore better able to crack down on dissent, whether online or offline. And of course, in this moment that we are all living in right now, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, and that's another line of research that I'm working on right now as well, we can also talk about what the pandemic means in terms of this process of digital authoritarianism. Because many of these regimes are also using this moment of the coronavirus pandemic in order to crack down even harder on their own protesters and activists and dissidents and opponents. So you see many examples where, you know, for example, you can be arrested because you are uh, being accused of quote unquote spreading disinformation or misinformation. Oh my God, you are an enemy of the nation. You don't use the term enemy of the regime, but you use the term you're an enemy of the nation and therefore you're a traitor and therefore we're going to arrest you because you are spreading false information or disinformation. So the crackdown became even harder in the context of the current moment of the coronavirus pandemic with regimes using the logic of spreading disinformation and misinformation as an excuse to crack down on any form of opposition. Not only that, but you see also the more technologically savvy countries in the Gulf region in particular, right? So countries like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, they have you know, a lot of technological savviness and a lot of resources, right? There is much more socioeconomic affluence, there is much more higher per capita income, the level, you know, the, the standard of living is much higher. Uh, so these countries have also more potential in terms of using technology. So is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? I always talk about the double-edged sword of social media and the double-edged sword of technology, meaning that even in this affluent part of the Arab world or the Arab region, when the governments have much more technological savviness and they have much more resources and they have much more money, that can also be translated into even more digital authoritarianism because they can use many of these resources to crack down harder on their own opponents. We have seen, for example, in the case of Saudi Arabia, you know, some of the young activists, the women activists like Manal Sharif, who started the uh, Women to Drive campaign, for example, on YouTube, Lujain Hazlul, and other, you know, uh, young uh, women who have been imprisoned and put behind bars because they also used social media and cyber activism in order to try to advance their own causes and to make their voices heard. In the case of Bahrain that I referred to before as the forgotten revolution or the invisible revolution because it was crushed by the regime in power, you also saw the regime using its own tools and its own mechanisms to try to silence dissent, in some cases even using fabrications. They fabricate certain things that are not, you know, never happened and attribute them to the opposition and say, oh my God, look at them. They are just, uh, you know, Shiites and they are just therefore Asians, they're working for Iran and they are not really interested in the welfare of the country. They're just traitors and they try to profile them in very negative ways and use social media in order to uh, smear uh, their own images and to present a skewed and distorted images of their own opponents. So you can clearly see here the double edged sword of technology and the double edged sword of social media, how it can be used by the activists and protesters to push their own agenda and to promote and to advocate for their own causes, 
but how they can also be used by the regimes in power to try to crack down on dissent and opposition and to silence opposition. And the more the countries have resources and the more affluent they are and the more technologically savvy they are, the more capable they are to actually crack down on dissent and crack down on opposition. So that's why we talk about this double-edged sword of technology and social media. Now, now that we had this overview of what kind of shifts and changes have been happening and this moment of digital authoritarianism that we are talking about, we also have to say that with the coronavirus pandemic, some of these regimes started to use what we call contact tracing apps and surveillance mechanisms, which means that in order to track the virus, they can track your loca location, find out where you are, and that in and of itself can also create other threats and dangers for opposition and for dissidents in this part of the world. Because, you know, it can be used to track the virus and track where you are and the, the contacts that you came uh, you know, in contact with, who did you meet, who did you talk to, where did you go, all of that stuff, which is like, oh yeah, well, you, we're doing that in order to keep people safe from the coronavirus pandemic. But at the same time, you can also easily understand how that can be used for the purpose of the invasion of privacy and even threat to the security of dissidents and opponents in the region. In fact, there is this one young a Saudi dissident, his name is Omar Abdul Aziz, and he is very outspoken on social media. He's a young Saudi dissident who lives in Canada, and he is very outspoken against the Saudi regime. And I wrote uh, also a chapter, I co-authored a chapter about him. Uh, it is called Arab Resistance in the Diaspora, the case of the Saudi dissident and the Egyptian whistleblower. So we did talk, myself and my co-author in this particular chapter, about the, the dangers that some of the young uh, you know, members of opposition can really face, including this young Saudi uh, blogger and activist Omar Abdul Aziz. And he talked about, you know, the Saudi government hacking into his own phone. And, uh, you know, that really endangers him and endangers his own family. So these are all cases and examples that we can, you know, give and the list can go on and on in this moment of digital authoritarianism. So now let's move on to the, the notion of accountability. And then we're going to end with the notion of how all of that impacts certain opponents. As we speak right now, we are seeing this ongoing tug of war, this push and pull mechanism between regimes cracking down on dissent and opposition and trying to punish those who did all of the, uh, you know, the work on the ground or the work online against the regimes and trying to fight against corruption and violations of human rights and between the regimes themselves trying to crack down on them and try to really kind of silence them whether by putting them in jail or silencing, silencing them forever by unfortunately killing them and keeping them silenced for good. This was our last presentation. Thank you everyone who has been listening to us and uh, we will be welcoming you tomorrow morning uh, at 9.30. We have uh, our presentations again tomorrow. They will all be online, so you can all uh, watch them again from here. And tonight, uh, whoever is with us in Eskisheri right now, we have the gala dinner uh, at uh, 7.30 p.m. So thank you again tomorrow, and uh, we'll see you. <laughs>